All right, so as I threatened earlier, I'm going to finish off this um, discussion of this, this you know, quasi-general purpose finite element code. Okay, we talked about in the last video the input for the model, right? And now I'm going to talk about how we actually go through the steps of, you know, writing sort of a general purpose um, finite element code. Now, there, it, it's exactly the same steps that we've taken to solve it that we've used so far. It's just using a couple little tricks to help kind of automate the process. Uh, so if you think about what we've done before is we do step five where we assemble the global stiffness matrix. We've done that by executing a sequence of operations in MATLAB, you know, three or two or three for each element. Um, we're going to replace that step instead by a loop where we loop over each element in the mesh, compute its stiffness matrix, and put that into the global stiffness matrix. All right. So whether you have three elements or three million elements, it'll be the same uh, code, just the number of loops it takes. All right. Then we're going to solve it. That's actually pretty much identical to what we've done before. Then we're going to kind of do the post-processing. We're going to write some results compute reaction forces and compute the elements strains and stresses and again to compute the element strains and stresses we're going to have another loop over each element and compute its strain and then compute its stress okay using the b matrix approach all right okay so here we go here's the end of the input we've input the files and now we're going to uh, start the general routine here okay so the first thing I'm doing is I'm just defining some basic variables that describe the size of the problems. So these are kind of useful for setting things up. So NN is the number of nodes. I can get that by querying the size of that node coordinate matrix. If you change that up here, where it has maybe three more nodes, then NN will be changed accordingly here. Um, the number of degrees of freedom, well, there's two per node, so it's just two times that is the total number of degrees of freedom. That's going to allow me to uh, size the global stiffness matrix as well as the force and the displacement vectors. And also we have the number of elements, okay? So we need that because we're going to loop over elements. And again, we get the number of elements, we can determine that from the dimensions of our nodal, I'm sorry, our element coordinate, our element connectivity matrix, con. The number of rows is the number of elements. So it's this is how you determine the number of rows in a matrix in MATLAB. All right. Now once we do that, we can define the global stiffness matrix as a bunch of zeros and and the uh, unknown displacement vectors again using the number of degrees of freedom. All right. So as we add nodes, this number will change and the size of k and d will change. Okay. All right. Now we're going to form the global stiffness matrix. That's what's going on here. All right, so this is a loop. E uh, goes from one to the total number of elements. So in this problem, the first time it goes into the loop, E is gonna have a value of one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six. Okay, somebody's at my door. I don't, I need a sign. I'm gonna pause for a second, excuse me. All right, so uh, I know for you, this was no time, but actually that was a bit of a break, so I forget exactly where I was. I think I was describing the element loop, right? So, right, there's six elements, so each time it goes through this loop, E will change from one to two to three to four to five and six, and that'll allow me to compute, you know, K for the first element, second element, so on, right? Um, so this here is basically just computing the element stiffness and this bit here is putting it into the correct location into K. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. Let me actually put a breakpoint here. I'm going to run and execute it right to this point. So we're going through the first time so you can see E is, is 1. This is the first element. Oops. Oh, wow. They 
step, step. Okay, so remember, um, we have this data structure con, right? So each row is the connectivity for that element. So row E tells me the connectivity for element E. So you can see here, if I do con E1, it gives me the first node in element E's connectivity, and the second column, you know, E2, is the second node in that, right? So for this particular one, we're going to have N1 is going to equal 1, and N2 is going to equal 2, all right? So you can see right here, N1 is 1, N is 2. All right, so those are the node numbers for the first and second node in the element. Now we're going to get the X and Y coordinates for those nodes, all right? So x1, y1 are the coordinates of the first node. x2, y2 are the coordinates of the second node. So you get that from the nodal coordinate matrix. Again, the row is the node number. So that's why we have n1 or n2, respectively. And the first column is the x-coordinate, and the second column is the y-coordinate. So if we step, step, now you can see the first node is at x equal to 0 y equal to 0, and the second node is at x equal to 240, y equal to 0, okay? So that's the, the element that goes across, right? Now, now that I know that, I can basically, once I know the node coordinates, I can compute the element stiffness matrix, right? I can compute the length of the element, right? Here's the Euclidean length. Now I can also compute the angles you know, the cosine and sine of the angles for this element, right? The cosine of the inclination of the element is the change in x over the length of the element. The sine is the change in y over the length of the element. We need the cosine squared, the sine squared, and the product of the sine and the cosine, so I just define those. So now they're all there, and I just stick them into the element stiffness matrix, right? So for the next element, Cosine and sine will change accordingly based upon the coordinates of the nodes of that element, right? So this all goes the same way. In fact, a better thing to do would be actually to write a function from sort of this point on that does the calculation of KE, but, you know, I'll show that later on, right? All right, so now I have the stiffness matrix for that particular element. Okay, so now that's the part where I want to describe it a little bit. Now we have to figure out where in the stiffness matrix we're going to put that. So actually, that is done with this array I usually call like the scatter array. And to, to help explain that a little bit, I've got, some, I've got a PowerPoint slide to kind of help with it. But basically, here is four rows and four columns of the stiffness matrix, right? This is row one, row two, row three, row four, column one, two, three, four they have to scatter into the global stiffness matrix into some global rows and global columns. That's what this is doing. So th this becomes a vector where each entry, the first entry says what global row, the first local row should go, what global row should the second global row go, third and fourth, and since it's all symmetric, the columns map the same way. So if I get this done correctly, then I can just do the scatter as follows. Okay. So how do we figure out how to get this vector correctly? Well, let's go back and look at this. Okay. So I just made a couple of slides. So here's our particular mesh here, right? And we have four nodes. Each node has two degrees of freedom. So if you look at this table here, here we have the four nodes. Each node has a U and a V degree of freedom. These are what we call the local degrees of freedom, but they correspond to a global degree of freedom, which is basically a row or column in the global stiffness matrix, right? So the X degree of freedom for node one goes to one, that's the global degree of freedom. The Y goes to two. Then for the second node, three and four, the third node, five and six, and for the fourth node, seven and eight. So they kind of have this cons uh, consecutive numbering scheme. Now, so, you know, if we had a fifth node, it would be nine and 10 and so on and so forth. So actually, if you know the node number and the local degree of freedom, it's easy to figure out the global degree of freedom it goes to. It's 
this relationship shown here. So if it's an x global degree of freedom, you take the node number, multiply it by 2, and subtract 1. If it's a y degree of freedom, it's just 2 times the node number. So like for example, node 3. Its x degree of freedom is 2 times 3 minus 1. So that's 5. Its y degree of freedom is 2 times 3, 6. And you can play this out for all these and you'll see it works out, OK? So this is a mapping to go from the local degree of freedom for a node to the global degree of freedom node. So if you know the node number and which local degree of freedom you're talking about, you can map that forward to a global degree of freedom with this set of equations. Well, that's what exactly we need to do with this stiffness matrix, if I can find the right. Oops. That's exactly what we need to do here. This is going to be that mapping, all right? And you can see even here, I look at, there's 2 times n1 minus 1, so on and so forth, all right? All right, so how is that going to work? Well, let's look at a simple example. This is element 3. It connects node 2 to node 4. So its stiffness matrix needs to connect the global degrees of freedom for u2 and v2 and u4 and v4. So if you look at this map, you can see obviously u2 and v2 is 3 and 4, and u4 and v4 is 7 and 8. So this scatter vector needs to be 3, 4, 7, 8. So that tells you where the stiffness matrix, the local stiffness matrix, goes into the global stiffness matrix. And that's why you can see I call it a scatter vector, right? It's a scatter vector. All right. And you can check these numbers. Uh, obviously, we got you can get them by looking up in this table. But if you use these equ mapping equations from the previous slide, you can see you get the exactly same thing, right? The x degree of freedom for node 2 is 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 1, that's 3, boom. The y degree of freedom is 2 times 2, which is 4, there you go. Now for node 4, the x degree of freedom is 2 times 4, minus 1, All right, so that's 7. And then finally, for the y degree of freedom, it's 2 times 4, which is 8. And that's how it goes, okay? And so maybe what I should do is go through here and actually, let's let's do let's just check the values for the uh, third element. So right now we're at the first element. Let me continue. So now it looped back up to this breakpoint. So now this is the second element. And now if we go further, and one more continue, you can see now I've looped up here. So e equals three. So now I'm at the third element. And now we've defined n1 and n2. So you can see n1 is two and n2 is 4, so that's the 2 to 4. That's how this element is connected. I need to get this one so it shows up. All right, now we can get the coordinates using the nodal coordinate matrix. So now we have x1 and y1, so 240 and 0, that's the node 2 and node 4, which is the second node, is 0, 180, right? All right, so now we can compute the length, the cosine, the sine, cosine squared, sine squared, the element stiffness matrix, there it is. But now we need to compute this scatter vector. So you can see this is the global degree of freedom for um, the x degree of freedom for node 2. 2 times n1 minus 1. So it's going to put in here for n1, 2. So this is going to map to 3, just like we got here, right? Uh, this is going to go to 4. This one is going to be 2 times n2. Now n2 is 4, so this is going to be 7 and 8. So if we step over that, you can see that the scatter vector is exactly what it should be. And now we're going to take the this 4x4 four four stiffness matrix and scattered into the global 8x8, eight eight, OK? And there it is. And now if we continue through all the elements until we get out of the element loop, 
now you have a fully formed stiffness matrix. That's the fully assembled stiffness matrix with all six elements in it, right? All done the same way, but through an element loop, okay? The trick is knowing uh, how to get the global node numbers from the connectivity matrix, how to get the node coordinates from the nodal coordinate matrix, and then to use that mapping to figure out the scattering vector for where the, the local stiffness matrix goes to the global, okay? All right, the rest of it's pretty straightforward. Now we need to solve. We're going to solve at the reduced degrees of freedom. So you remember up top here, one of the inputs is for you to supply what degrees of freedom are unconstrained, and there they are, right? So this is going to solve the reduced system. So this only works for homogeneous bound displacement boundary conditions currently, but we can change that. And now we have the displacement, so there it is, okay? So you can see the displacement of node 2 and node 3, right? Now, this is just printing out the displacements, so no big deal there. Um, that's fine. So this just loops over each node and computes and writes out the x and y displacements. Reaction forces, you know, in the, in the way we've always done it, figure out, multiply the stiffness matrix by the solution, and you get the external forces. Uh, but let's go let's go down here and get to where we compute the element strains and stresses. So again, this has to be done on an element by element basis. So we loop over all the elements. It's the same type of loop we did before. But now instead of computing the stiffness matrix, I actually am going to compute the element B matrix, right? So it pretty much goes the same way. All this stuff goes the same way. We need cosine and sine. And that forms the B matrix. All this stuff, N1, N2, here are the coordinates, just like the computation of the stiffness matrix. Length, cosine, sine. So that allows me to get the B matrix. And now, instead of using the scatter vector, which is the same as we had before, instead of using the scatter vector to put a local stiffness matrix into a global stiffness matrix, we're using this to extract the degrees of freedom for that element. So this is going to take, you see we use it in D. So this, is, this vector is going to allow me to take the appropriate degrees of freedom for the first element or the second element or the third element. So for example, let's just do a, let's get it to be E to be this third element because that's where example was. And now if I step through all this stuff, right, here's the B matrix, right? These are the nodes, two to four, right? So... Oops, ah, dang it. Oh, I screwed that up. But okay, so the scatter vector is the same. So scatter vector is this. So I want to get from the global D rows three, four, seven, and eight. Those are the X and Y displacements for the node of this element. So that allows me to get B times the displacements. That gives me the strain. Then I just multiply the strain by Young's modulus and I get the stress and I print it out and so so forth, right? This last one, I won't talk too much about this one. This one is just a, uh, uh, it kind of loops over the elements and it plots each element using some MATLAB stuff and, and actually scales the deformation so you can see it a little bit. And that is pretty much it. And that is the end of the program, okay? So the important stuff is this, uh, really in here, this element looping, figuring out how you get the node numbers, the node coordinates, and this scatter vector. This is kind of important, okay?